the, the gentleman's time's expired. I now recognize myself for five minutes for the purpose of asking our witnesses questions. Uh, I will note that after the passage of SB 202, apparently Georgia's won a World Series with the Atlanta Braves, uh, and the University of Georgia won two national football championships. So I can't believe that there's any state in the country that's not trying to pass voter integrity legislation. Um, I, I say that as a, a firm believer in the University of Wisconsin and, uh, and a Brewers fan. Uh, but in a, in a serious sense, as we look at the impact uh, that SB 202 had here in Georgia, as we think about uh, the American Confidence in Elections Act, the ACE Act that we've introduced today. Um, I want to go back, if I can, Dr. Ruth, with you, um, and look back at uh, a University of Georgia survey uh, that they did after the election. Um, in particular, it asked people about whether or not they faced voting problems. Um, in particular, we had, we had a lot of conversation about uh, underrepresented minority groups and some of the challenges that they may face. In that survey, do you know what it said? Is it related to uh, African Americans who faced, quote, no uh, voting problems? Yes. So, um, just to give a little background, that the UGA survey, uh, uh, it, the UGA surveys 1,253 registered voters, 64 percent voted early, 30 voted on election day. And it is true that 0% um, of African Americans responded that they had a poor voting experience. That, that's, a, that's a pretty positive thing after we were told uh, that SB 202 was Jim Crow 2.0 by the President of the United States. Uh, following re an analysis of that data and your knowledge of the, the Georgia election law, do you believe that, that SB 202 was truly Jim Crow 2.0? I do not. You do not? I think that's really important because it's easy to have false narratives thrown at election integrity legislation like the ACE Act. But when we examine the underlying empirical data, often we're finding that those narratives are false and are simply trying to scare people from passing strong voter integrity provisions that at the end of the day increase voter turnout. And so if I can, if I can jump to you, Ms. Nuruddin, is we look at the turnout um, in the 2022 election, was the turnout rate in Georgia higher than the national average? I believe it was. Yeah, it was 57 percent. The national average was 52 percent. So following Georgia passing an election integrity bill and implementing that bill, Georgia's voting at a higher rate than the national average. To me, giving further evidence that passing election integrity in election integrity actually enhances individuals' confidence in their elections, and as a result, more people are participating in the process as they have confidence in the elections. If I can go back to you, Dr. Ruth, on something we talked about as related to, to ballot drop boxes. In Georgia, before COVID, so go back to 2018 and before, were ballot boxes legal in the state of Georgia? No, they were not. They were not. And then following the passage of SB 202, ballot drop boxes are now legal. There's rules and regulations around them, but they're now legal in the state of Georgia. Is that accurate? They are. So it would be fair to say that SB 202 actually increased the use of ballot drop boxes in the state of Georgia, did not decrease them in the state of Georgia. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I, think, I think that's pretty important. And then if I can come to you, Mr. Vince Bukowski, um, Looking at President Biden's executive order, it's 14019, because I know you're a numbers guy and in the details, quote, promoting voting access, end quote. Uh, it requires federal agencies to do a lot of things, but it does a lot of stuff that really is uh, partisan election work. Um, do you have concerns that federal agencies would be using federal taxpayer dollars to engage in partisan elections? Uh, yes, and the problem with that executive order was that the president had no constitutional statutory authority to start directing federal agencies to not only engage in voter registration activities, but also was telling them to help voters obtain and, and vote their absentee ballots. I mean, that's, that's outlined in the executive order. And there, this, this is so potentially confusing to voters uh, and to state election officials that a number of secretaries of state protested this, saying you, you are going to confuse our voters. And, and just one other thing on this, Mr. Chairman, I think is very important. Um, individuals who are members of, the, members of the public who are applying, for example, for benefits, vulnerable members of the public, 
veterans benefits, social security disability benefits, and suddenly the federal clerk they're dealing with says, oh, by the way, uh, you need to get registered to vote. Oh, and can I help you with your absentee ballot? What are those vulnerable members you, of the public to think? Boy, I, you, I better do this. I better vote for the... You, you and I, Mr. Spakovsky, share, share the same concerns yeah. on this, that when you allow the federal government to use federal taxpayer dollars for election partisan purposes, there's a whole host of concerns. Let me, let me yes. come back to one final point that I think is really important. Our, our bill prevents that, uh, might I add. But as we look at funds coming into elections under the guise of charitable entities, 501c3, right. 501c4s, the risk in particular of Zuckerbucks or of nonprofit entities getting involved in electioneering, I have grave concerns with. Another thing that I have real serious concerns with is foreign money coming into U.S. elections with the loophole right. of charitable entities. Does this bill clear up both the loophole of prevent of a, which currently it would allow Zuckerbucks to come through and obtain a tax-free advantage? This closes that, correct? It, it closes it, and this is a needed change. In and, and then the, the second one that it closes is prevents a, not, a, a foreign actor, a foreign person, a non-citizen from putting money into a U.S.-based charity, which would then be transferred to a super PAC to then do the bidding of a foreign actor. Is that accurate? Yeah, that, that is accurate, and again, that is a needed change. I, I think at a minimum, those are two things that my colleagues across the aisle should be supportive of. I think those are absolutely critical reforms. But I'm, I'm going to now uh, yield back to yield back to myself uh, before and before we close this hearing just want to say thank you to all of our witnesses for being here thank you to our audience I think on the whole uh, we kept it in check uh, as we were going through a pretty important topic uh, but I also want to give a a big thank you uh, to the the staff and the students at Georgia State University we just can't thank you enough for your hospitality today. <laughs>